The story begins as we see people revolting and a country engulfed in flames, while the Imperial Princess Mia Tirmoon cries for help as she's dragged into a cell. Three years pass, and Mia is still in her cell with only a diary. We see two soldiers bringing her spoiled food with rotten yellow moon tomatoes which she hates, but the soldier forces her to eat it, saying that it will be her last meal. We learn that Mia is about to be executed, and as she walks toward the guillotine, the citizens eagerly await her beheading. The guillotine falls and we see blood splattering all over her diary, but time suddenly starts to rewind, and she wakes up to find herself back in the past when she was 12. She dismisses everything that happened as a dream, but finds her diary containing all her entries next to her. She convinces herself that it's all a dream, and decides to have a meal. The head chef checks up on her, and she remembers that she fired him two years later because he used to serve her vegetables. He serves the meal, and Mia is reminded of the food she had gotten in her cell. While the head chef explains why he added vegetables to the stew, she tastes the food. She's amazed by the taste and learns that the dish is made with yellow moon tomatoes. Tears of joy roll down her face as she remembers the rotten food she had gotten in prison. The head chef panics, thinking he made a mistake, but Mia thanks him for the meal, and everyone is in shock to hear appreciation from the self-centered princess. He says he doesn't deserve the praise, and explains that the stew tastes good because the tomatoes are left to simmer for three days. He adds that he must ensure the royal family remains healthy, and mentions that a single meal costs the same as an average family's monthly budget. Mia is suddenly reminded of another person asking her if she knows the cost of the royal family's meals, but can't seem to remember who it was, so she decides to have something sweet instead. She orders the servants to bring something sweet, and we see one of the servants bring her a cake. She's excited for the cake, but the servant trips and falls onto the cake just before reaching the table. The servants are shocked to see Mia remain calm as she asks the girl if she's okay, saying that a cake is replaceable but she snaps when they inform her that it was the last cake. She tells the servant girl to look up and sees her crying. She recalls that her name is Anna, the girl who visited her while she was in prison. We see Anna stick by her while everyone else left her. She remembers thanking Anna before the execution and apologizing for not being able to reward her devotion. Anna hugs her to console her, which makes her cry. Mia tells Anna she will reward her for her devotion this time and assigns her the role of handmaid. The other servants object, saying that Anna is clumsy, but Mia warns them not to insult her handmaid. Mia goes back to her room and reads her diary, finally believing that it's real, before realizing that she will die in eight years. She asks Anna to buy her sweets as she hands her a gold coin, but Anna explains that a gold coin is a lot of money, equal to two months of her pay. She tells Anna to get something for her family with the remaining money, and tells her that she doesn't need to be so formal with her before leaving for the library, and she reads her diary to recall her memories. We learn that the finances of the Tier Moon Empire will dry up in a few years while a famine spreads, and people will revolt, aided by the neighboring countries. Mia starts feeling hopeless, because she doesn't know anything about politics and economics, but vows not to give up, declaring that she will do everything she can to prevent her death. She visits the Gold Moon Ministry, which deals with finances, to find someone like Anna who also stayed loyal to her, but Anna misunderstands and thinks that she's in love. Mia can only remember the man's appearance and how he tried his hardest to restore the empire's finances. She overhears someone discussing the empire's deteriorating finances and finds the person she's looking for, but gets annoyed after recalling how he lectured her in her past life when she went to praise him for his devotion to the empire. We learn his name is Ludwig, as the person speaking to him threatens to send him off to another province, but Mia intervenes, knowing that only Ludwig can fix the Empire's finances and save her from getting executed. She drags him away, as he pleads with her to let him get back to work, but then decides to hear her out. She asks him about how they can fix the Empire's finances, which catches his attention, and he asks her if she knows how much money is spent on the royal family's meals. But Ludwig is impressed when she answers, as we see her repeat the things he had once told her in her past life. He compliments her wisdom, and she's delighted by it, since he never praised her in the past. He tells her that she might not even need his help, but realizes that she's too young, so people might not listen to her. 
Anna watches them from a window, as Ludwig gets down on one knee to commend Mia, and she misinterprets it as a romantic gesture. Ludwig starts thinking that Mia is intelligent and admirable, so he pledges to do his best to help her, as she recalls his last visit when she was imprisoned. Back in her room, she reads her diary, when suddenly the text disappears and gets replaced. She flips through to see if Ludwig managed to save the Empire, but finds that she still gets executed. She's still hopeful, and decides to read the new text to see what else she can fix. She finds that there is going to be a disease outbreak in the slums, and an uprising from a minority group, along with international issues. Not knowing how to solve any of the problems, she decides to visit Ludwig, but Anna tells her that she must look good if she's meeting him, and dresses her up. Mia takes them all to the New Moon District to prevent a future outbreak of the epidemic, and they all request to go back, but she tells them that the trip is necessary, so that Ludwig can advise her better. They are disgusted by the smell, but she finds it pleasant compared to the odor from her cell. She spots an emaciated kid, and tells Anna to give him their food. Ludwig notes that a person like the boy could fall ill at any time, so she asks him what they can do to prevent an outbreak if it occurs. They decide to take the child to a church nearby, as Ludwig thinks about how all his efforts could have been in vain if an outbreak occurs, and he's amazed by how Mia realized it. At the church, Ludwig tells her they can give people food and provide medical care to keep them healthy, but doing this will be a drain on their finances. But Mia decides to build a hospital in the district, and donates her hairpin to raise money, thinking it's more useful to use it like this, since it will be stolen in the future anyway. Ludwig thinks that she's benevolent, and uses the hairpin to convince the nobles to donate money for the hospital's construction. He collects the required money in 20 days, and the construction begins. Anna brings Mia frozen desserts, and tells her that everyone is praising her, saying she's the people's goddess because of her help with the hospital. She offers to share the dessert with Anna, but she gets sad thinking how much her little sister Eris would like to eat those desserts. So Mia suggests visiting her home, where we meet Eris who is bedridden, and apologizes to Mia for not being dressed properly, but Mia is too fixated on the desserts to notice. Eris shows Mia a story she's writing, titled The Impoverished Prince and the Golden Dragon, and Mia remembers that Anna used to tell her this story in the past. But she didn't get to hear its ending, because Anna told her the author died before completing it. Mia decides to hire Eris as a writer, but she says she doesn't want to be hired just because of her sister, so Mia reassures her that she chose her because of her talents. Eris wonders how Mia picked up so much from the story in such a short time, and Mia tells her what she enjoyed about it, but accidentally mentions the parts that she has yet to write. Anna thinks that a wise person like Mia can figure out where the story is going, and Mia agrees with her immediately, convincing Eris to become a writer. Spring arrives, and we see Mia preparing to leave for the Saint Noel Academy. We learn that the Academy is a school for the young elites, located in the holy state of Beluga, and is the headquarters of the Central Church. Near the Academy, we see some girls bump into a maid, while Mia plans to stay away from Xion Sunkland and Tiana Rudolvin, the two people behind her execution. Xion is the first prince of Sunkland, a skilled swordsman, and a firm believer in justice, while Tiana is from a lesser noble family from the outskirts of the Empire. She was bullied heavily by Mia in her past life, which led to her forming the revolutionary army with Xion, and ultimately leading to Mia's beheading. Anna points out Tiana getting bullied by girls to Mia, who tries to ignore it, but is forced to live up to Anna's expectations and intervenes. The girls are shocked when she introduces herself, and Xion watches the situation from the side. She questions the girls, who try to justify their actions by calling Tiana an outland noble, so Mia tells them that every imperial subject is equally favored in her eyes, making the girls run away. Tiana starts to cry after being treated as an imperial subject for the first time, and we see that she and her family were always treated as outsiders, so she had to work hard to get into the academy. Mia gives her a handkerchief, but quickly runs away. Xion discusses Mia's reputation as the wisdom of the empire with his attendant Keith, believing that she has the qualities suited for someone from a royal family, and we see that Mia has unknowingly left an impression on the two people she wanted to stay away from. Mia gets her back scrubbed by Anna, as she recalls how she only got a pail of cold water once a week when she was imprisoned, and she insists on doing the same for Anna, 
wanting to repay her for sticking by her in her previous life. As they finish up, they meet Rafina Beluga, the daughter of Duke Beluga, the ruler of the state. Mia recalls how she was attracted to Rafina's power, but failed to befriend her despite many attempts, which caused her to feel worthless. She's amazed that Rafina knows her name, and Rafina invites her to join her in the water. She invites Anna as well, who sits far away, but Mia tries bringing her closer, and Rafina asks if they are close, so Mia tells her that they are friends, causing Anna to cry tears of joy. Rafina reminds Mia of the upcoming welcome party, which she had tried to forget, because in her previous life, Xi'an chose Tiana over her as his dance partner, but she decides she won't be alone this time, and she excuses herself. She plans to use the party to make good connections, telling Anna to help find her ideal partner. We later see her waiting for Abel Remno, the second prince of the Remno kingdom, whom she chose because Remno is on the opposite side of the sunk land, and can protect her from a pincer attack in the case of a revolution. Mia walks in front of him, and drops her handkerchief, hoping he will pick it up, so she can start a conversation with him. But he ignores it, and flirts with another girl instead, as she recalls that he used to be a big flirt. Mia hides when she sees Xion pick up her handkerchief, hoping he doesn't find out that it belongs to her, but Tiana arrives and tells him that it belongs to Mia, because she got the same handkerchief from her. Mia tries running away, but Tiana spots her, and she pretends that she dropped it accidentally. Xion introduces himself, and takes the chance to offer himself as her dance partner. We see Mia doesn't want to be involved with him, but can't reject him because it would scare everyone else away, but Xion suddenly gets distracted when Abel is taken away by his older brother. Mia excuses herself and follows them, and sees the brother slap Abel before degrading him, claiming that a loser like him will never find a decent woman. She intervenes, and Abel's brother tries to scare her away, but she just finds it amusing since she has been through much worse. She says she's Abel's dance partner, before introducing herself to the brother, remarking that she may not be a decent woman. We see Xi'an arrive, and Mia rejects his offer to dance, saying that she'll be going with Abel instead. Abel follows Mia to tell her that he doesn't think he's suitable for her, suggesting that she should go with Xi'an instead, but she tells him that he needs to improve for her. Abel says he's not a match for his older brother, much less Xi'an, but she encourages him by telling him that it's possible to surpass any talent with effort. Abel waits for Mia at the party, as we see her in her room being dried off. We learn that she was ready, and on her way to the academy grounds, when she tried to pet a horse, but it sneezed all over her and ruined her dress. Anna is unwilling to let her dress plainly for the party, and we see her arrive in a gorgeous white dress as everyone watches in awe, thinking that she looks like a moon goddess. She's nervous before she finds Abel, who compliments her, restoring her spirits. Mia and Abel start dancing, but the onlookers aren't impressed by their dance. We learn that Mia has the special skill of social dancing, and that she's leading Abel in the dance, covering for his mistakes, but Abel feels incompetent for holding her back. Anna walks down a street with the money that Mia gave her. She collides with Tiana's maid Leora, who pleads for her help, saying that Tiana has been kidnapped. At the party, Abel takes Mia to Xi'an, asking him to dance with her, while he gets them a drink, forcing her to dance with him. Anna follows Leora to the North Tower where Tiana is held, and they are followed by Keith, who sees them snooping around. Mia starts dancing with Xi'an, planning to humiliate him, but she is surprised by his dancing skills, and their performance shocks the audience. The nobles try to credit it to Xi'an's skills, but Rafina corrects them, saying that a great dance requires two people. Keith decides to help the two girls, he knocks down the two guards standing in their way, and they manage to find Tiana. Tiana explains that her dress was stolen, which we see torn up, and says she found a note telling her to come to the North Tower if she wanted it back. Keith reveals a handkerchief he found on one of the guards with the Tear Moon symbol, and theorizes that the Imperial nobility is behind the kidnapping. Tiana tells them that she was told not to attend the party, because she would be a disgrace to the nobility, and says that she doesn't have the money to buy another dress, but Anna gives her the money from Mia, telling her to buy a dress. Keith questions Anna about aiding Tiana while serving as Mia's maid, suggesting that Mia might be responsible for the incident, but Anna laughs at him, and Tiana also says that Mia would never do such a thing. 
Mia finishes her dance and notices Abel sitting alone, as Shion asks for another dance, but she declines, telling him that there is someone more suited for him there. Tiana arrives at the party, delivering a letter from Keith, and Shion learns about the incident. Shion mistakenly believes that Mia must have seen Tiana while dancing, and entrusted him to look after her. Abel offers Mia a drink, and she's impressed that a person her age is treating her like a girl rather than a princess, so when he expresses his desire to be as good as Xi'an at dancing, she offers to give him lessons. We later see Mia shocked when she learns about the kidnapping, and decides to do something, fearing that the others might get mad at her. The nobles behind the incident complain to Mia after having their attendants taken away, and argue that confining a lower noble isn't a big deal. Knowing that their moral values can't be changed, she tells them that Rafina, who rules the academy, won't overlook such incidents, shifting their discontent to her instead. Rafina wonders if suspending the culprits is too lenient. Mia is intimidated by her, but when she looks at her stew, she says she realized how rotten it is to refuse yellow moon tomatoes once you don't have any food. Rafina seems to think she meant that the culprits didn't know that their actions were bad. Rafina explains that the two reasons behind a punishment are compensation for the victim and reflection of the offender, but since the compensation was handled by Anna already, a merciful punishment like this will allow the offender to reflect and grow. Mia agrees with her immediately, and Rafina is impressed by her wisdom, asking her to be her friend, leading Mia to become friends with the person who considered her worthless in her previous life. We meet Chloe Fork Road, the daughter of a wealthy merchant who has bestowed noble status, as she finishes reading her last book, wondering what she should do next. Mia comes up to her, asking if she likes reading books, and asks her to be her friend. Chloe thinks Mia is taking pity on her after seeing her alone, but Mia tells her that it's because she likes books, and that she wants a reading buddy. She gives her heiress's story, and Chloe wishes there was a reading club where similar people could gather, making Mia think about other clubs. We see Mia arrive at the horse riding club to learn how to ride a horse, so she can quickly escape if a revolution occurs, when she meets the head of the club, Lynn. He asks her why she wants to learn it, and she says that a horse will take her as far as she wants to go. Lynn is moved by her words, thinking that Mia really appreciates horses. Abel also arrives, and we learn that in this timeline, he joins the horse riding club instead of the game club. Lynn tells him to give Mia a ride on the horse, but we see that she's terrified by how high they are. She sees Anna, and tries to wave at her, but ends up falling from the horse, and somehow landing on Abel, but she gets flustered after being so close to him and backs off, telling him not to get too close. Abel gets nervous, but Mia assures him that she feels the same way, and we learn that they're both nervous for different reasons. Mia checks her diary, but sees that the future hasn't changed, as Anna arrives to tell her about the upcoming sword fighting tournament and how it's a custom that the ladies prepare lunch for the person they like. Mia again recalls her traumatic past, when Xion rejected her lunch and she had to eat it herself, so she decides to prepare lunch for Abel instead. While riding with Abel again, she asks him if he has someone preparing lunch for him. He tells her he doesn't, so she offers to prepare his lunch. But her plans are ruined, when every shop refuses to take any more orders because they're all full. Anna suggests making the lunch themselves, but since both of them have never cooked before, Mia decides to find helpers. She asks Chloe for help, but Chloe has only read about cooking and has never done it. Anna tells Mia that she brought an experienced cook, but Mia is shocked to see that it's Tiona. Mia reluctantly accepts her help, and suggests that she should also give lunch to Xion, so that if the lunch is bad, it will drag him down as well. We see Keith ask Xion if anyone offered to make lunch for him, and he says that he rejected everyone who offered. Keith agrees with his decision, thinking that if Xion accepted lunch from a particular person, it might have negative political consequences, but thinks it would be fine if the one offering the lunch was someone of equal standing like Mia. Tiana tells Keith that they plan to make lunches as a group, and he's impressed by Mia for coming up with a plan which won't have any negative consequences. Mia tells Abel that she will be making lunch for him and she on herself, and Abel is excited to try her cooking. They reach a beach where they enjoy walking together, and Abel expresses his disappointment that he's not the only one eating her cooking. He lays down his jacket for her to sit down on, as he practices his swings, and Mia is impressed by how hard he's training. 
He tells her that he feels better about sharing his lunch with Xion, saying that otherwise, people might think that he was only able to defeat Xion because of her lunch, making Mia realize how high his expectations are for her lunch. We see Keith feeling uneasy, so he visits Mia, but is shocked to see a giant horse-shaped bread, and advises the girls to make it smaller. Tiana shows him the vegetables she's cut, and he's confused by the absurd amount of chopped cabbage. His concern grows as Leora and Chloe show up, making him worried about the princes, so he takes charge and instructs them to make a sandwich. Tiana does as he says, but Mia who is tasked with baking the bread, makes them all horse-shaped. Keith restrains himself, and just decides to go with the horse bread. At the tournament, Anna brings Mia and Chloe food from one of the stalls, but Mia accidentally eats the red pepper on it. Abel brings her water, and is accompanied by his older brother, who informs them that he will be facing off with Abel in the first match, saying that Abel will lose for sure. He calls Mia a child for not having good taste since she chose Abel, but Abel stands up to him. Mia thinks that it would be good for Abel to lose, restoring the older brother's self-esteem and allowing her to deepen her relationship with Abel by comforting him, but as she recalls how Abel has been treating her, she encourages him to win instead. Their first match begins, and Abel barely blocks his brother's attacks, but he gets angry when his brother says that he would hurt Mia. Abel uses the first stance of the Remno sword techniques, striking his older brother and defeats him, shocking everyone, including himself. Mia congratulates him for winning, and we see them later having lunch as Mia hopes that he will humiliate Xion in battle, but Xion suddenly joins them, reminding them how they plan to have a group lunch. Abel is amazed by the shape of the sandwich, complimenting the taste, and Mia is overjoyed. Xion apologizes to Abel for thinking he would lose to his older brother, and Abel tells him that he thought the same, saying that he got lucky. Xion tells him that luck is also a part of it, and Abel gets up to shake his hand. Mia tries to get Abel's attention by holding his clothes, but he thinks that she's telling him to stand proud, so he challenges Xion and tells him to come prepared. Xion and Abel face off in the arena as the battle starts. Abel uses the same attack he used to win against his brother, and we learn that Xion's specialty is countering every attack, but he doesn't counter Abel's attack and steps back instead. We see that Abel's attack left his arm numb, as Abel continues to push forward, attacking repeatedly. Keith is impressed by Abel's strength, recognizing him as a worthy candidate to be a king. Mia cheers for Abel, and Xion asks him if Mia is the reason for his sudden improvement. Abel agrees with him, saying that it's all because of her encouragement, and that he will try to live up to her expectations by winning. It starts to rain, and Anna tells Mia to get inside, but she says that she wants to witness the battle to its end, and Keith assumes that she wishes to awaken Abel's true potential. Xion finally counters Abel's attack, but he manages to dodge it. Xion tells him that he will lose if he uses the same attack again, but Abel decides to use it again, but with all his strength. They charge towards each other, but the referee steps in, stopping the tournament because of the rain, so they both promise to have a rematch in the future. Mia comes to Abel, claiming he would have won if not for the rain, and starts to curse the rain, saying that a miserable person must have wished for it. But we see in her previous life, she was the one who wished for rain after Xion rejected her. Mia goes to the Empire for her end of term break and reads her diary on the way, which tells her that her last meal changed to yellow moon tomato stew, making her realize that she will still be executed due to food shortage and conflicts with an isolated tribe. She visits Ludwig and discusses ways to mitigate any possible food shortages without burdening the royal reserves, coming up with the idea of getting a friend discount. She summons Marco Forkroad, Chloe's father, in hopes of striking a deal with him as a merchant, and asks him if he can have goods imported from overseas. He tells her it's possible, but is shocked when she tells him she wants to import wheat, under the condition that no change in price will be permitted, even during a famine. He's skeptical at first, but when she mentions that she will always be purchasing a certain amount at a fixed price, he considers her offer, and Ludwig gives him the details of the contract. Mia feels nervous about the low prices, but chooses to trust Ludwig's judgment, and Marco realizes that the deal guarantees him great profit, since he will be expected to accommodate them during a famine, in exchange for importing wheat at elevated prices in normal times. 
He's impressed by Mia's ability to keep his interests in mind, while establishing a system for preventing starvation, and Ludwig realizes the same thing, so they both praise her for her wisdom. Mia visits New Moon City, where the atmosphere has become more cheerful since her last visit, and she meets the sickly young boy from before, who is now healthy, as he gives her a unicorn hairpin, which was made from a tree in his homeland. She thanks him and wears it, making him so flustered that he runs away, as a priest tells her that it is a memento of his late mother, who came from a small tribe living in the remote forest of stillness. Mia realizes that this tribe is the Lulus, who according to her diary, would later come into conflict with the Empire, and she will have to find a way to deal with them. We learn that a noble from the Empire named Berman, plans to expand his lands by developing the Forest of Stillness, after being manipulated by his peers to compete with the Outland Count Rodolvin. But his plan fails after being met with resistance by the Lulus, and the guards he bribed refused to follow his orders in order to maintain peace so he arranges a meeting with Mia. Mia prepares to enter the court, as Anna brushes her hair, complimenting how glossy it has become after she started using the shampoo Abel gifted her, but she doesn't know that it's horse shampoo. Berman praises Mia's hair, and compares it to the glossy shine of a horse, trying to feed her ego to gain approval for developing the forest. But Mia interrupts him, and expresses her desire to visit it immediately. On their way to the forest, Ludwig tells her about the problems in developing Behrman's lands, which fills her with dread, as it directly leads to her execution, and she instantly decides to crush his plans. At the forest base, the commander discusses the selfish demands of Berman and how he won't risk his men to fight in the forest. He goes outside to find the Imperial Princess visiting him, which he assumes is part of Behrman's plan. Mia sees the commander, causing her to faint, as she realizes that he's Dion, the man who executes her for letting the Empire fall into ruin and letting his men die. She later wakes up, and he introduces himself to her, but she continues to panic, making him suspicious, but she tells him she's scared of his partner. Ludwig convinces Dion to let Mia visit the forest, so that they can get the best read on the situation, despite her attempts to avoid it. But Dion agrees to this, and she ends up going with him. Mia wonders if stationing guards is even necessary, so Dion tells her it only raises chances of conflict, saying they don't even want to be there, but they can't withdraw without proper reason. As they head deeper into the forest, he tells her not to touch anything, since the tribe may find it disrespectful and attack them. She ignores his warnings, as she trips on a tree's roots, and she blames the tree for what happened, so she kicks it, triggering an attack. She drops her unicorn hairpin, which an attacker picks up, and while taking her to safety, Dion scolds her for not listening to him, but she orders him to take her to Behrman's mansion, so that she can feel safe. After escaping from the attackers, she tells them to take the entire unit back to town, under the pretense that it's for her safety. At the mansion, she orders a halt to Behrman's operations, while Dion and his men enjoy their time in the town, realizing that her actions were an excuse to pull out the troops. Mia returns home, and Anna notes that her unicorn hairpin is missing, which causes her to panic, as she fears it could be another trigger for her execution, so she plans to retrieve it. Dion agrees to accompany Mia to get her hairpin back, since her bluff allowed him to withdraw his troops, but she feels uncomfortable being alone with him. Meanwhile, Ludwig asks Dion to become one of her generals to help Mia accomplish her goals, and he agrees to this. While in the forest, Dion falsely credits Mia for using her hairpin as an excuse to negotiate with the tribe personally, and she pretends that it was her plan all along. They reach the spot where her clip fell, and notice they are being watched, so he calls out to the Lulu tribe people, who appear with their chief. The chief demands to know where she got the hairpin, threatening to attack her based on her answer, as Dion prepares to defend her, making her happy, but she realizes that he's hesitating, thinking she has the entire situation planned out. As Mia struggles to get the situation under control, Leora shows up and vouches for her, so the chief tells her that the hairpin was his gift to his wife, who later passed it to her daughter. Mia informs him of his daughter's death and mentions that she received it from a child who she assumes is his grandson. The tribesmen don't believe her, but the chief realizes that she entered their territory with only one guard, thinking she isn't lying, so he orders the soldiers to pull out of the forest. Mia offers to reunite him with his grandson, because she wants to avoid any conflicts, but the chief thinks that she's warning him not to repeat the mistake he made with his daughter, 
and is deeply moved by her offer, as Dion is impressed by her foresight. The next day, Mia is summoned by her doting father, after he receives word of her recent endeavors from Berman, and she seizes the opportunity, requesting that the forest be made part of her lands. So the emperor orders Berman to build a princess town and a castle for Mia near the forest, which casts momentary doubts in Ludwig's mind, as it might invoke resentment in Berman. But to his surprise, Berman happily agrees to this, as Ludwig realizes that aristocrats value honor above all else, and the opportunity to manage the princess's lands means more to them than land disputes. A letter from Tiana arrives, asking for her patronage concerning her brother Cyril, so that he can attend a school abroad. She recognizes him as the genius who developed a new variety of wheat, under Princess Rafina's protection in Beluga, during the famine in the past life, and realizes she must keep him in the empire instead of sending him abroad. We see Count Rodolvin talk highly of Mia after her recent achievements, while Tiana also praises her, which makes Cyril curious about her. As Mia arrives, she notices Cyril watering plants, and sneaks in the opportunity to leave a good impression on him. She meets the Rudolvans, and proposes to send Cyril to the new school she's establishing in Princess Town, which she plans to be a competitor to Saint Noel, in an attempt to prevent draining the Empire's talents to foreign lands. She also asks Rudolvan to stock up on wheat, for distribution to the people in case of famine, telling him to use her name as a favor. Rudolvan is moved by her graciousness, as he explains that his previous attempts to distribute wheat for free, were seen as an act of rebellion against the empire by other nobles, and using her name will give him the opportunity to do it without any resistance. Mia is confused by his positive reaction, and tries to explain that the school she's establishing will not have the extravagance of the schools, which the great houses patronize. She explains her plan to accept students widely from common folk to neighboring Lulus, trying to hint that she's not giving his son special treatment. But he's moved by her thoughtfulness, and Cyril finds her inspiring as well, so she takes this as a victory. Mia checks her diary after getting back home, and it vanishes before her eyes, because she has successfully prevented her execution in the future. But as she celebrates, a group of men who have been trying to ruin the Tirmoon Empire, are seen reassessing their plans, and aiming for another target. Mia returns to Saint Noel, where she meets Chloe, who reveals that Marco has been calling her the wisdom of the Empire. Rafina greets them, and invites them for tea, where she discusses Mia's plan to build a new school for commoners. She finds her decision bold, but Mia explains that talent has nothing to do with lineage, while trying to cover her true intentions, and Rafina is deeply moved by her words. Anna barges into the room, to inform Mia of the brewing revolution in Remno, as Xion, Keith, and Tiana follow her inside. Keith clarifies that there's a popular uprising in Remno, which is calling for a revolution, and reads out a letter he received from the Sun Clan's intelligence agency, the Wind Ravens, which suggests there are signs of insurrection, so military intervention may be required. Keith explains that the political situation in Remno is precarious, as they heavily tax their subjects to maintain military power and are proposing a further increase in taxes. A count named Donovan spoke against it, to represent the people's discontent, but while he was trying to mediate the situation, something happened in the kingdom. Mia feels devastated thinking about Abel, and despite wanting to stay away from conflict, she can't help but want to save him. Chloe suggests using her father's caravan as a cover to enter the nation, and everyone agrees to join Mia. So they follow Chloe to further understand the plan, while Mia urges Anna to stay and focus on her duties. Anna is upset, because she can't join them, but Rafina reminds her she's Mia's confidant, and can help her in ways only she can, which gives her an idea, and she leaves to do her work. The group proceeds to Remno, as they talk about how nervous Mia must be, but we see that she's only feeling sick because of the bumpy carriage ride. Xi'an announces they will be crossing the border soon, but they are attacked by bandits. The group fights them off, trying to protect Mia, but she ends up falling off the carriage. Xi'an jumps after her, and they fall into a river. When Mia wakes up, she thinks that Xi'an will resuscitate her by giving mouth to mouth, but he uses a different technique, opening her mouth with his fingers. Mia thanks him for saving her, but he tells her that their troubles are far from over, as they are in the north of Remno, and will have to cross the mountains to reach Abel. 
They build a bonfire to dry themselves, and Mia asks if he would condemn Abel if he had a hand in oppressing his people, recalling her past life. Xion says he would have no choice but to turn his sword against him, but Mia makes him question his opinions, feeling furious that he didn't think to stop her in her past life, instead of sending her straight to the guillotine. Xion thinks Mia is suggesting that they stop the revolution before Abel has the chance to turn evil, which he sees as a good option. Walking the long road to Remno, Xion thinks that their attackers weren't bandits, but trained assassins, who seemed to know which carriage they were in, and he thinks it could be due to an information leak. He picks up the pace, as Mia complains about being hungry, so she goes to grab a mushroom, but a passing hunter tells her it's poisonous. He asks them who they are, and Mia almost exposes them, before Xion stops her, and reminds her they need to hide their identities. He inquires about the hunter's identity, so he introduces himself as Mujik, saying he's from a nearby village, and Xion tells him that they're the children of a merchant who got separated from their parents after being attacked by bandits, saying they need to reach the capital. Mujik offers to let them stay the night at his house, and promises to ask if someone in the village is heading there, so they follow him back. While enjoying their meal, Xion asks Mujik if he knows about the revolution and its effect on the village, but he explains that the people are too busy to worry about revolutions. Mia thinks the revolution's timing is odd, since the famine is three years away, but gets distracted by how delicious her stew is. Mia and Xion head off to the capital, after thanking Mujik for his hospitality, but we see that Xion is worried about Keith and the others, warning Mia that he won't be able to protect her if they get attacked again. Anna brings the whole situation to Ludwig's attention, and he suggests deploying the princess guard for Mia. But Dion joins them, saying it could be seen as an invasion, but he isn't worried about Mia, since he trusts in Xion's skills, calling him a sword prodigy. Ludwig thinks that a tax increase shouldn't have caused such a dramatic backlash, suggesting someone is inciting the revolt. Dion says that solving this issue without bloodshed is tricky, but Anna believes that Mia will find a way to resolve it. Mia and Xion learn from their guide, that Count Donovan has deployed Remno's elite unit, the Adamant Infantry, to quell the revolt. Xion worries that this might escalate matters, wondering if there have been casualties, but the man tells him that the unit hasn't clashed in battle yet. We see Graham, a member of the Wind Crows, working undercover as a civil servant in Remno, trying to decode Mia's love letter to Abel as he searches for clues about the revolt, but he only becomes frustrated. His assistant Monica informs him of Mia and Xion's whereabouts and tells him to not read too deeply into Mia's letters. Graham is frustrated to see the unit not making a move even after spreading false news about the king imprisoning Count Donovan. So he asks Monica to deliver a false message and after she reads it, she becomes concerned that it will spark a war in the nation, but Graham belittles her, telling her to do her job. She leaves feeling irritated and ends up running into an arrogant noble who berates her, but Abel defends her and warns the noble not to disrespect the maids. She comments on how he has become stronger than before, so he tells her that he can't let Mia see him being pathetic and reveals that he will be joining the troops to lead the battle. Moved by his sincerity, Monica switches the false information with the real one in hopes of making a change. As Mia and Xion reach Remno, they attempt to meet up with Keith, but when Xion realizes he has no money to pay for a carriage, Mia reveals the money she had hidden after learning from an encounter in her previous life. As Xion leaves to bargain, Mia is kidnapped by revolutionaries, and she wakes up to see two boys who try to bully her, but she gets saved by a girl who scolds them for mistreating her and orders them to make preparations. She asks Mia who she is, but isn't bothered when she doesn't tell her and cuts her free as she asks her if she can stop the revolution, pleading to save her brother. She sneaks her out of the revolutionary's underground lair, while explaining that her brother, the leader of the revolution, was manipulated by Jem, the man who gave the order to capture Mia, seeing her as a threat. Xion finds them, and learns that the revolution's true aim is Count Donovan's release, which he thinks is a foolish decision considering the Count's position among the people. Mia suddenly remembers how in her past life, Donovan played a crucial role in helping the people out of poverty and starvation, but he was killed off, with the royal family being blamed for his death. She realizes there's something odd about this story, but before she can say anything, the revolutionaries begin gathering in front of the mayor's manor. Lin takes them to the manor despite Mia's protests, 
and on their way, she tells them that Jem is a man who her brother met at a bar, and that he thinks Mia will be an obstacle in the revolution. Xion says that he might have been allied with the group who attacked their carriage, and that he's choosing places to attack, as they see more revolutionaries wearing blue caps heading towards the manor. Mia asks about the blue caps, and we learn that they are used as a symbol of the revolution, so Xion suggests wearing blue caps to blend in with the crowd. We see a man addressing the blue caps about the injustices they are facing, as the crowd cheers for him. He notices Lin, and recognizes Xi'an and Mia as the two potential obstacles in the revolution. The crowd is about to attack them, but Lambert stops them, and Lin implores him to hear them out. Lambert welcomes Xi'an and Mia into the manor, while being aware of Xi'an's true identity, and expresses his aim to gain support from his kingdom. They discuss the complexities of his plan, where he wants to keep the Adam and infantry distracted. Xi'an acknowledges how difficult that would be, and becomes wary of Lambert, while Mia notes that she shouldn't underestimate him. We learn that Remno is known for its vast highways, and it has a military which benefits from the mobility of those highways. Xi'an deduces that the increase in taxes could be linked to plans for invasion, and he considers the facts he knows so far, thinking about changing his goal, but when he looks back at Mia, he calms down. But Lambert views Mia as a threat to the revolution, and believes she must be silenced. He offers her a comfortable stay at the manor, which she happily accepts, making him think that she's childish and easy to manipulate. Xi'an tells her she was naive to accept his offer, even if they won't hurt her, but Mia is too distracted by the fact that the shampoo she's using is different from the one Abel gave her, and Lin decides not to tell her that it was horse shampoo. The next day, Lambert receives a report, which mentions that the unit led by Prince Abel is being deployed to a fortress, and Xi'an explains that the objective of the move is to rouse the Adam and infantry. He feels disappointed in Abel, because he participated in the suppression of his people, telling Mia that he will ask him what his intentions are, saying he might even kill Abel if his actions lead to the populace suffering. Planning to stop them from clashing, and figuring out the situation, Mia volunteers to go with him. We see Jem trying to persuade the imprisoned Count to join their cause, but he refuses to be swayed by his words. Meanwhile, Abel's advisor urges him to plan an attack on the rebels, before they receive news of Xi'an and Mia's request to visit him. Abel is happy to see Mia, but suspects that she might have hidden motives, and he instead turns to Xi'an, asking him why he wants to see him. Xi'an tells him he originally intended to come as Mia's guard, but is unable to ignore what's happening, challenging Abel to a rematch. Abel immediately accepts his challenge, as he doesn't want to look weak in front of Mia, and wants to prove himself to his troops, while Mia looks at them with confusion. They prepare for their duel, while Abel orders Bernard to guard Mia, as he wants her to act as a witness for their duel. The two princes discuss their opinions on justice and royal authority, as Abel says that without royal authority, there would be more chaos, and if there's corruption, his role is to correct it, but Xi'an says that he can't allow him to oppress his own people. They start fighting, exchanging blows, as they brace themselves for the final clash, while Mia tries to stop them in vain. As she starts feeling hopeless, Dion intervenes and stops the fight, which enrages Bernard, and he attacks him. But Dion cuts his weapon easily, as Ludwig arrives with Anna, taking control of the situation. Mia gets overwhelmed by emotions after seeing Anna, until she realizes that everyone is waiting for her to address the situation and stop the revolution, when her only goal was to meet Abel. She nervously stands before the troops and embarrasses herself, which lightens up the mood, as she orders the troops to retreat without attacking the rebels. Mia recalls her experiences from her past life, and she suspects that somebody is pulling the strings behind the scene to divide Remno and involve Sunkland. As she tries to figure out how to explain this without exposing her past, Bernard understands what she means and summarizes it for her, but he tells her that they must still dismantle the rebel army. She reveals that the rebellion's true motive is to free Count Donovan, which Abel and Bernard are surprised to hear since they never knew about his arrest. As they try to speculate where the Count is being held, Keith and Tiana arrive with news, emphasizing the complexities of the unfolding situation. While Keith reports to Xi'an, Abel and Mia check up on each other, as she scolds him for not listening to her, and fighting Xi'an. Abel points out how she doesn't refer to Xi'an by his title, so she explains that it was part of their undercover act, realizing that Abel might be feeling jealous. 
She awkwardly suggests that they should also refer to each other without titles, as Xion comes to apologize to Abel. Keith explains that the instigators are a rogue unit within Sun Clan's intelligence agency, and Mia realizes that this was the reason why Sun Clan was always viewed favorably at the end of Tiermun's and Remno's rebellions. She feels conflicted and wonders what Abel will do since he has the right to condemn Xion. Abel tells Xion to raise his head and explains that as a royal, it was his responsibility to use the military to control the situation, even though he was always concerned about his subjects. He adds that with Mia's help, they now have a way to stop the conflict, as Mia taunts Xion for finally experiencing failure, saying he should always give others a chance to start over if they make mistakes. Still feeling a little irritated at him for his rash decisions in her past life, Mia says she will punish him, which Xion immediately accepts. She tells him to stand in front of her, as she prepares to kick him hard, after remembering how Anna told her that her kicks weren't painful. Xion doesn't feel any pain from it despite her best efforts, but he assumes that it was on purpose, so that he will always think about whether the other person can be forgiven the same way he was. He tells Mia that he finally understands the true meaning of justice, and praises her for her wisdom, while she looks at him in confusion. Mia switches the topic, and asks about Count Donovan's whereabouts, so Keith shows her a map of where he might be. With Lin's help, they reach the location on the map, and Mia is apprehensive, knowing the man who was responsible for her execution is in the same building where the Count is being held, but she finds the courage to face him. Jim feels frustrated at his plans ending in failure, as Xion announces their arrival and charges into the building with everyone. They successfully defeat the rebels, causing them to surrender. Mia is happy to see things working out, and Anna mentions that her hair looks rough, offering her the horse shampoo to use later. While celebrating, Mia trips into the basement and spills her shampoo, landing in front of Jem. He holds Mia hostage, as everyone surrounds him, but she finds the opportunity to escape, only to slip on her shampoo and kick Jem in the groin. After subduing Jem and capturing the instigators, Mia requests Xion and Abel to spare them, but they both think about the intricacies of the situation and wait for Mia's judgment. She thinks about how she got a chance to redo her whole life, and worries that these men might also get the same chance, which would put all of her efforts to waste, as she thinks about the life she gets to enjoy now, after being given another chance, and the friends she has made. She asks Abel if sparing them is possible, and he assures her that he will try to convince his father, so Xion asks what she plans to do with them. Since Jem continues to get on her nerves, she suggests handing them all over to Rafina for a three-year lecture. With the troubles in Remno over, Mia asks Tiana and Ludwig to venture into the capital, and asks that Lin, Lambert, and the rebels be forgiven, while Mia and the others return to the academy, where they enjoy a picnic together. Mia is finally able to enjoy her life, but since the future is still open to change, she is determined to do everything she can to fight for her happiness, but that's where this video ends. Remember to like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.